right down. I was actually based in Brighton at my university days. I went to University of Sussex, and it was uh, so it's quite nice to be back home in a sense. Um, so this talks on leaders' role in enabling organisational competitiveness in a fast-changing world, and one in which where we can create the conditions where leaders, teams, individuals, uh, all parts of the organisation can have the conditions for continuous transformation. The world is changing. Um, every day, every moment, there are new emerging surprises and opportunities and threats. So we need to be able to set the conditions where we can encourage our organisations to move on and continuously transform, transform to find value from themselves, for the workforce, as well as for the community, its customers, its consumers, and so forth. Um, so yes, I've, I've been fortunate to work for a number of different organisations, uh, some of the logos up on the screen right now, and the organisation that I'm proud to be working with at the moment is Tech Systems, um, for those who may not know it. We actually have a stand as well, so you can come and grab one of my colleagues or myself afterwards uh, to have a conversation about ourselves. So Tech Systems is, can be described as a full stack um, um, technology um, um, service provider or professional um, service provider. Um, we have um, a global presence uh, and one of the areas that we, we're proud of delivering is enabling organisational change to be able to find with our customers the right ways of working to be able to recognise and deliver that value in that fast changing world. Uh, something else that I'm involved with is the Agilist. I've been planting a few copies on people's uh, tables um, outside. Uh, the Agilist is a non-profit print-only publication for the Lean Agile community. So if you haven't seen it yet, feel free to pick it up and leaf through the pages. So let's get on with the talk itself. So here I have a talk from a gentleman who you, some of you may know of, Jack Welsh. Uh, opinions on, on him was somewhat uh, split or controversial, but one thing that he said um, when he was CEO of General Electric about 20, 25 years ago uh, is that if the rate of change on the outside exceeds the rate of the change on the inside, the end is near. If the rate of change on the outside exceeds the rate of change on the inside, the end is near. To me, this speaks uh, of how this could be applicable on many different levels, both from an organizational point of view, a team point of view, a leader's point of view, or perhaps um, people who are coaching and supporting leaders, but also from a personal point of view as well. We do live in times of great change. It seems like the clock cycle of, of, of transformation is ever increasing. We own, our locus of control is quite small. So how can we collectively, within our organizations, club together to navigate and actually embrace variability, those, embrace those aha and gotcha moments to be able to navigate to deliver that value for ourselves, our teammates, and the communities and customers that we're serving. So I have this thought in mind uh, as we kind of go through the next slides. Something else worth bearing in mind is um, a tool, uh, a business analysis tool called Pestle Analysis. And this is quite a useful tool to consider when looking at market disruptions. So let's break this down. And let's think about uh, things in the news that we hear about current affairs things we hear about online or the TV or the radio when we wake up in the morning, perhaps we tune into what's happening in the world. And let's, let's kind of put this pestle analysis lens on, on those fast changing um, um, situations that we're living through right now. So political, we do know that um, there are great um, uh, malevolent forces in the world that are creating a lot of uncertainty, uncertainty geopolitical uncertainty. Um, we know that that can have a direct or second order or third order impact upon the economy. The pound, euro, yen, dollar in our pocket is being squeezed continuously and that's also for our customers as well. We know that um, inflation globally, certainly in the UK, is, is an ever-present threat and perhaps an increasing threat. We know that social change is also a, an ever-present factor as well. For many countries, um, uh, that we may be delivering products and services to, there is a uh, uh, democratic, democratic uh, collapse uh, where uh, there's an aging population. Uh, so this is going to affect you know, the products and services we want to be able to deliver to our customers. Technology as well. 
Um, I shan't label the point about Gen AI, but that's very popular at the moment to consider how that might impact our customers and ourselves as well. And legal as well, uh, the penultimate element of the pest analysis. Um, uh, so with legal, um, we know that there's an increase in trade war between the different countries, different regions, different sectors. Uh, we know in the UK, for example, the repatriation of uh, EU regulation has given us an opportunity to have a blank slate. Some might think that the politicians have screwed that up, but despite the fact, there is, there is an opportunity there. And then finally, environmental as well, which is very much at the forefront of many of our minds and, 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 and the minds and directions and ambitions for our organisations as well. So, all of this constitutes an opportunity as well as a threat. An opportunity and threat uh, uh, that we can think about in terms of, our, of the business models that we want to operate and the ones we want to change as well. So, I'd like to just give an example of one uh, example from about two or three years ago. Uh, one where there is business model disruption, um, not only for the way in which we offer things to the customers, but pretty more significantly how there is disruption to what we hold dear and what we hold as a success that we may have had yesterday, but maybe less relevant success for today, for, for today and for tomorrow. So how might we think about the future state of our organization, the value that our colleagues, our teammates, our workforce can provide, and what can be done quite radically? So here's a simple example that I picked up for the Financial Times from two or three years ago. So those not familiar with the retail environment within the UK, uh, Morrison's is a top four supermarket grocer, and they've partnered up with Deliveroo to allow Deliveroo to um, provide goods uh, within minutes from, from the store of, of Morrison's. So Morrison's is no longer a retailer in this situation, but actually become a wholesaler, be, become a, a supplier. And that's quite a large um, business model disruption. And it's pretty taken a great deal of challenge and debate and, and uncertainty for the stakeholders and, and the workforce to be able to transition from this particular business model to the next one to um, be able to align themselves with a, with a disruptor. So as this article says, Morrison's acting as the wholesale and delivery setting customer prices. So not only are Morrison allowing delivery to take things from the different supermarkets, they're actually setting their own prices and that's actually quite a delicate, sensitive thing for a, an incumbent organization such as uh, Morrison's to allow to happen. So something else that we can consider uh, is mapping this onto the business model canvas that some of us may be familiar with. Every single domain within that business model canvas is being disrupted. And what I quite like about this example is they are being proactive. They're considering the status quo and they're looking for opportunities, safe to learn um, opportunities to see what's right and wrong. And that can be extremely challenging for, for many stakeholders within an incumbent organization. Um, Morrison's the late Victorian organization, so they've been around for, you know, 130 years. So, how can we, as coaches, as leaders, set conditions for continuous transformation? So, what I'd like to do for the rest of the talk here is go through four prerequisites where we can encourage and support and create that enabling environment for organizational change in a fast changing world. And this is to allow the fostering of exploration and emergence. The first of which is leaders supporting individuals to test assumptions. So I'm gonna be bringing in some tools, some of which may be familiar uh, for many people in this room here, but set in a different context. Number two is leaders acting as grand conductors. Number three is leaders to create a safe to learn environment. And finally, the fourth one, leaders form and protect, protect and adapt a space for innovation for the operators to be able to take the successes, the early tentative, delicate, fragile successes from the innovators within the organization. A very important dynamic or social relationship between those innovators and those operators that, that tends to be um, not recognized within the organizations we work in. So the first, leaders supporting in individuals to test assumptions. To do this, let's think about the psychology that, that many of our colleagues may be 
have in their mind. So there's two, broadly thinking, there's two different responses that an individual, perhaps a leader, may have to uncertainty. One is that they could metabolize uncertainty as a threat, and their response may be, let's respond with some certainty, but it's false certainty, perhaps certainty which was a, they were accustomed to many years ago with previous success. A second thing, there may be a tendency to rely on past experience. We were successful five years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, so why can't we be successful in the new world as well? And that response is one where they, they're, 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 they're grabbing onto and hugging um, 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 something comfortable from, from before, which is misplaced. And lastly, they may try and shape and take control of the situation. They may try to have a deterministic outcome with predefined steps. We are all familiar with that, that, those kind of notions that we try and address in our ways of working. Let's think about a different leader. Let's think about one which adopts a, an adaptive response or one which is akin to a growth mindset. Here that leader is brave enough and shows the vulnerability to understand broadly what the direction is, but understand they don't know what the answers are. So they might respond amongst their colleagues, amongst their peers, let's see what to do. They might ask different questions. They may scan the world, uh, the world or, their, or their colleagues' opinions, diverse opinions. These may be opinions of even dissenters and whistleblowers. And thirdly, they may consider new approaches to enable others. So this is really about creating the conditions for emergence and experimentation. Taking that on board, what might that leader do? So I've taken um, this illustration from um, the book Unlearn by Barry O'Reilly. And there are techniques which are similar to this, such as objectives and key results, which are very much in vogue at the moment. So these kind of tools, hypothesis-driven development, both for the products and services that we want to develop and offer to the market, but also for internal change as well, that's quite important, are tools that we can consider. And what's important as well is that we cannot transform all the people at the same time. And even that is presumptuous. We've got to be able to set the conditions where people are attracted to some kind of change journey. And one of those change journeys for learning and discovering emergence could be hypothesis-driven development. So what I've got here is a, is a, a simple example um, from a fictitious company, a fast food retailer. And um, let's say uh, they have a quarterly business objective to trial cryptocurrency payments in the North American market. So due to, a good strategy always starts off with a diagnosis of the problem. Due to the substitution threat of customers choosing crypto as a form of payment, which they don't offer at the moment, we believe offering payments via crypto in the US and Canada will result in some early adoption. There's early kind of uh, signals in the noise. Adoption of, that, of crypto transactions uh, amongst um, the younger adult um, segment. So they're running some early experiments, but they haven't bet the farm on this. They haven't put all the eggs in one basket. So they're running some early experiments, perhaps within a few of their restaurants. We are confident to proceed if the signals are correct when financial transactions happen in a reasonable amount of time, that's a leading indicator to suggest this, is a, this could be something successful. We have repeat customers, some crypto, popular cryptocurrency uh, currencies or tokens um, for some proportion of the market. So these are all good leading indicators. <laughs> that is not a good leading indicator. <laughs> we'll do an edit afterwards. <laughs> Thanks. Thirdly, um, that some proportion of this customer segment are making transactions, very small, 1.5%. And I need to put focus back on my laptop, and the cursor is working. Um, and also, there is, I'm just realizing I'm walking across the screen here, I do apologize. Um, uh, also, there's an, there's an increase in net promoter score. So these are all indicators to suggest whether these, this emergent idea is right or wrong. And also, what's important with our experimentation, we need to look at the, 
the negatives, the, the what could be externalities. So cryptocurrency fluctuations, these things go up and down every single day, every single week. Uh, do not affect our revenue within some kind of um, um, constraint. So, so what I'm introducing here is the concept of um, um, limited liability. So we want to, what's really important here with the limited liabilities is we want to um, consider those stakeholders within organisations who are quite conservative and quite negative. And what we can do, we can actually invite them into the experiment design and say, you know, what's your concern? I'm really concerned it's going to hit revenue. So include them in those fast to learn experiments and a small number, in this particular case, small number of restaurants for a small amount of time. So secondly, let's consider uh, another leadership behavior which will allow this continuous emergence to occur. So leaders acting as grand conductors. So what I'd like to do um, is uh, refer to the thinking of a gentleman called David Marquet, who wrote the fantastic book, Turn the Ship Around. And just referring back to Tech Systems, that book is actually available to win. If you go to our booth, you're able to uh, uh, fill in a, a short form and submit some details, and you may be a, a, a lucky winner of that book with five other books as well. But nonetheless, okay, <laughs> um, back, to, back to the script. So what he, what he talks about is if you think crudely about how an organization is structured, we have teams and individuals at the bottom of the pyramid. And... We have middle management in the middle, and then we also have, like, at the apex of the organization, we have our leaders. What tends to happen in a traditional organization is that the individuals and teams at the bottom have the information. They're aware of what their customers want, what their desires are, what their unmet needs are. And in a traditional organization, information is, is passed up through middle management to where the authority is, and those with authority make a decision, and a decision comes back down again to be implemented. Let's suppose that takes six weeks. There are many disadvantages, disadvantages with this arrangement. Um, one of which, if it takes six weeks in a fast mover market where our organization wants to outcompete and outlearn the competition, six weeks is just not going to cut it. So, what does David Marquet say when he recognizes this? He says there needs to be an appropriate balance between the control an individual has and the, and the control the team has with the competency and clarity. The competency, what the mission is what the quarterly OKR may be, or what the, uh, uh, the two iterations uh, kind of goal may be, and have the technical competency. If we can equip um, our workforce with the right mastery, ambition, and understanding of what the mission is, we should be able to afford them a great amount of control. But this cannot happen overnight. So what David Marquet says is, is give op find opportunities where we can give more control. So here we are going up this kind of ladder of leadership where um, we may be having a dialogue as a coach or as a leader with, with individuals within our team. I'll give you an example from a few months ago when I was helping out uh, a team, at, um, a financial service organization. So uh, a, a young uh, gentleman, a recent graduate, um, um, was on our team to help put together um, a dashboard of flow metrics. And he was a very competent person, had the te technical know-how, knew what their mission was, but he kept going to the team and saying, what should I do? What, I don't know what the next steps are. I don't have the confidence. So at that particular level, what David Carr mate, David Marquet would say, and what we did was like, ask them if they're at position one on the right-hand side, think about position two, have dialogues like, what do you think? What ideas do you have? How can we actually implement this, this flow metric dashboard? And over a few weeks and a few months, that person was able to share, not only ask them what to do, but they said, what, what, what do I think? And then that was an opportunity to invite them, what do you actually recommend? So you can see here, this gentleman had a great amount of control. Well, had, uh, had a low amount of control, but a great deal of competence and clarity. But gr gradually, incrementally, we want to be able to elevate them up to give them more and more control. Give control first of all, David, Car David Marquet talks about. Let's move on to the third uh, condition. Can I just get a quick time check? Is that all right? 11.25. 50 minutes, thank you. Um, so David Marquet talks about, well, he talks about how to create conditions for, for, for this emergence to happen on a conversational level, on a level which is very personal, where leaders are able to free up the time to nurture and support the emergence of, 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 of the individuals within our teams and within our workforce. Let's think about the third condition that, that certainly at Tech Systems we found to be really successful. 
and that's to create a safe to learn environment. So I'd like to bring on board the work of Ron Westrom. Um, a small number of decades ago, he did some fantastic work studying how different uh, companies, uh, divisions within those companies and teams within those companies, how they operate and from a cultural point of view, from an organizational kind of uh, psychological point of view. And he, by studying dozens and, and dozens of different organizations, he was able to map where they might be on this type of topology. So he found some organizations are pathological. Some organizations are bureaucratic, where other organizations are generative. And what's really interesting is the organizations which were once generative, they allowed information to be shared, risks to be shared, they allowed debate and challenge to occur. Um, they may have started as generative, but they actually gravitated, perhaps through past success, to become bureaucratic or pathological. So I'd like to illustrate this with an example from NASA. So NASA was formed in you know, the late 50s, early 60s in response to Russian Sputnik. It was a great shock to American society that their great Cold War rivals were able to launch this artificial satellite into space. So NASA was formed, um, and they, they, they were extremely generative. The information was shared, risk was shared. They, they, were, they, they embraced variability. That variability could have had, you know, included those aha or gotcha moments where we needed to change path. And um, in that environment, NASA was extremely successful for the first kind of decade or so. They had the Gemini program. They landed a person on the moon um, with, with the Apollo program. But over the years, they, they, they become more efficient and less effective. Great silos of specialisms emerged. And you, you guys may be seeing this within your own organizations as well that have been around for a number of decades. And unfortunately, what happened, this led to um, some, perhaps some willful blindness or some ignorance or, or um, wedding themselves too much to kind of previous success and pride. And, and they moved to a bureaucratic organization. And this meant those risks that would have been listened to, that may have changed the path, were being ignored. And one um, unfortunate example was the Challenger launch in 1986, if memory serves me. The Challenger um, shuttle um, got into orbit, uh, left Earth's atmosphere with the help of booster rockets, which were um, engineered by um, a number of different suppliers. And there was a great deal of political pressure to launch a Challenger on that on a particularly cold morning. And the morning was particularly cold, meaning that uh, the, the sealant, the O-rings on, on those booster rockets would not operate at that, at that level of tolerance. And the engineers from this supply was desperately trying to tell the NASA leadership team, do not launch in this morning. We don't know what's going to happen. Despite that, despite the messenger being ignored, being neglected, that, that, that shuttle launched. And within a few seconds, within a minute or so, unfortunately, that shuttle exploded because of the booster rockets, the sealant weren't um, tolerant at that, on those kind of bitterly cold temperatures with the loss of, of, the, of the crew. So this is an example of where NASA was generative, but they, based on previous success and, and not adapting to change, not being aware of the messages, the warnings from other parts of the, of the kind of organizational ecosystem, meant they became bureaucratic, and that, that can lead to disaster. And I just want to quote um, a bit more about the story from Barry O'Reilly. I think I've mentioned this book a bit earlier in Unlearn. He said that, that while NASA was having tremendous success with this manned space program, the organization was sowing the seeds of failure, creating a false intellectual superiority and towers of information. In time, these towers turn into silos. So think about our own organizations here. That stopped information from moving across the organization. Again, think about our organizations here. That became a real problem for NASA and led directly to catastrophic failure. 
result in the loss of life. So he's talking about the Challenger disaster here. Unfortunately, there was another disaster around 2003 based on the same problems. Thankfully, now NASA's learned from those, from those sad stories and, and, and improved. So how can leaders create a safe-to-learn environment which are shown characteristics which are more generative? And one, there's going to be a talk from my colleague uh, Joanna a bit later on, on governance. And that governance is a dirty word, but, but I think we should reclaim that word and be able to create enabling governance where this information can be shared. Messages can be sent across the organization to address these, these endemic, intractable problems. So one thing we've done for one of our customers at Tech Systems is to create a safe to learn environment. There's quite a lot on this slide here, so I'm gonna rattle through it quite quickly, but you can ask me questions. Hopefully there's gonna be some time afterwards. So if individuals have in any part of the organization, in any part of the, of the department, have a, have a clarity of what the mission is, what the quarterly OKRs are, what we're trying to do from a multi-year vision, a winning aspiration. If they've got some ideas, they're able to have very, very little governance to be able to present that idea and have that backlogged, prioritized. There are no governance or financial controls on that, this enabling governance structure. Of those towards the top of the backlog, we may want to build it based on, on some kind of hypothesis approach, similar to that one from that fast food retailer. And here we have slightly tighter governance here, in that we want to be able to just test using that concept of limited liabilities of a very, very small number of our customers. And we may want to inform the CFO or the local individual in charge of financing of, of our particular area, because that's gonna have some kind of capital expense and if it becomes a going concern on operational expense. Of the few which are successful when we build it, maybe it's only one in ten, we want to be able to nail it. So we want to make sure that not only is there a problem solution fit, there is a market fit as well. We can actually scale this, it becomes a going concern, we can operate it, we can continuously improve it. Here the governance constraints may be a little bit tighter, maybe capital expenditure we might want to limit to I don't know, 10,000 pounds. And we want to inform the CEO as well. Penultimately, we want to be able to scale it. If this is successful in one particular market or one particular customer segment, we want to look for opportunities. There's a different problem set for others uh, to benefit from this, from other customers or stakeholders. Here we might need to write a lightweight or a reasonably lightweight business plan because this is actually going to add, in some sense, complexity to the organization to run this as a going concern. And finally, we want to operate it. And only a few of these are going to be able to graduate to this level. But what I'm describing here is that there could be, at the start, low confidence, many things we're testing and probing the market, what, how our customers are responding, are they picking it up off the shelves, are they signing in, whatever it might be. And a few of those actually graduate to this level where we operate. And this is where safe to learn um, conditions or a safe to learn environment is underpinned and, and enabled through good supportive governance. And there's a number of different kind of leading and lagging indicators that, that we want to be able to monitor. Okay, I think I've got about almost five minutes left. Uh, the last one is around um, Leaders forming and protecting an adaptive space for innovators and operators. Okay. So I want to bring in the work of another complexity thinker, another academic, Mary Albeen. Uh, and she um, can views an organization as one in which we have these entrepreneur, these entrepreneurs, these innovators, and we have these operators. And what tends to happen with um, organizations which are successful is these operators have their own pressures to be able to squeeze more and more margin out of the current products and services. They're incentivized differently. They are, their ways of working are, are very familiar and they're looking for less variability. They want to continue and optimize past success. The entrepreneurs or the entrepreneurial system have a different set of concerns and they're excited about different things. They want to embrace variability. They don't want to remove variability. They want to have those aha and gotcha moments. But what happens in many of our organizations that have been successful in the past is the operational system stifles the emergence of the entrepreneurial system. 
perhaps because it's somewhat pathological or somewhat um, bureaucratic. So what Mary Orbean recognizes is, yes, the operational system does start for the emergence of, of those innovators, those entrepreneurs, those, those people who are kind of corporate mavericks. But really, for those operators, for the vast majority of the organization, for them to exist in a fast-changing world where they need to find new offerings for the market, they need those people on the innovation side. It's absolutely critical. And without this, I think we're sadly going to see the demise of many more organizations that we probably work for or are aware of. So in order to do this, um, Mary Orbean talks about how we can create an adaptive space where frank debate can occur, where there's innovators and operators that come together, review, consider the early successes of the, of the innovators, and see how we might be able to operationalize it or, or scale it. So I'm gonna, I've only got a few minutes left, so I wanna kinda end on an example here of, of um, a piece of work that I was involved with for a um, supermarket grocer. And uh, this supermarket grocer was again around for many, many years, and, they, and, they, and some of the individuals in the organization felt that they wanted to change the customer experience within the stores, and they wanted to kind of innovate and allow customers to essentially use their iPhones to scan the barcodes on the back of products and pay with Apple Pay. This is absolutely radical. <laughs> many, many of our stakeholders were afraid of shrink, so customers could just pretend to scan some whiskey or some razors or some high price items and pretend to do it and just walk out the store. Again, what I mentioned at the beginning is that we, don't want, we want to be able to understand the concerns and risks of those stakeholders who are skeptical and include them in the experiment, experiment design, include them in, um, in uh, sorry, let's go back a second, include them in designing what the limited liabilities are. So in this particular case, the limited liabilities were um, only on meal deals, so uh, um, purchases of less than £10, three stores for three weeks, and, and just kind of, uh, limit the experimentation there. So we, we included um, those, those people who were skeptical. We didn't run the experiment despite them, but we run the experiment with them. And this particular case, there would have been nine other experiments which didn't work, but this particular case for this grocer has now become a going concern. It's now part of their um, available service to customers for all their stores up and down the country. I've only got a few minutes left, so I'm going to skip over this and end with the quote from Jack Welsh. So, so Jack Welsh, so he said, if the rate of change on the outside exceeds the rate of the change on the inside, the end is near. So let's consider that, and let's consider the, the stories that I've shared. And what I've shared was uh, conditions for continuous transformation, prerequisites for organizational competitiveness in a fast-changing world. And I've said that the leaders' roles and our role to support those leaders is to allow individuals to test assumptions, leaders to act as ground conductors, think of the thinking, the work of David Marquet, create a safe to learn environment, and lastly, leaders to form and protect and adapt a space for those innovators, those with their early ideas to work with operators, so those few ideas which are successful, they can be scaled, and they can allow the organization to continuously give value to the workforce, society, customers, and stakeholders. On that, I'd like to end. Thank you.